All right, do me a favor. Stand to your feet if you would. I need you so, to interact with me. Come on, everybody, stand up, stand up, stand up. I need you to do me two favors. Number one, I need you to find somebody you don't know and tell them one thing you love about Christmas. Just anything that you love right off the top of your head. Secondly, do, do me a favor. Encourage them. Say something positive about them. Figure it out. Talk amongst yourselves. Go. <laughs> Y'all can be seated. You can be seated. We'll get to why we did that in a minute. I don't know. I just felt like doing that. That was fun. Is everybody feeling good? We're week three in a series called That. Um, you remember Prince, the artist Prince. For a while, he went no-named. He went with his symbol. This series is a scriptio continuo. What do you see? We've been asking, is it God is nowhere or God is now here? Week one, we looked at a word. What was the word we looked at? Can anybody throw it out? Noel. To, come on, let's say that together. Noel, the excitement of birth news. Last week, we locked in on a word, paradox. God's ways are different than our ways. Sometimes we don't understand why he does the things that he does, especially at Christmas time. And so we're trying to focus in on the meaningful and not the meaninglessness of Christmas. So I told you that I have you for four hours and that's those of you that are awesome that are here this week, because here's what we know. Last week, we had 2,711 people come to church. All right, that's good. Now, we had a huge number. I wonder if that's because the awesomeness of the preacher or the kids sang. Let's vote on that. Who thinks the preacher is awesome, and that's why we had a lot of people here? How many think the, the kids sang and so we had a huge number? I'm not stupid. I'm not dumb. So we know that this is how this ebbs and flows throughout the Christmas season because it's easy to get distracted. Yeah, it's easy to get distracted. We do have a, we have a quiet room, by the way, for our children. It's easy to get distracted. Um, we know that a lot of people came to church opening weekend, and then last week it went way up here, and this week it'll kind of be down here a little bit, and next week with Christmas with family to be way up here. Why? Most people now, this week, they're at Tanger for some odd reason. It's easy to get distracted in the meaninglessness of Christmas that will do you no good from this moment forward. But if we focus on the meaningful, good things can happen. If we're smart about utilizing this season, it can fuel our faith. Is everybody with me? Yes, everybody with me. So this week, um, we're going to focus on the word Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel. Um, which we just sang about it, God is with us. And we're going to lock in um, this way. Um, Albert Einstein, how many people have ever heard of Albert Einstein? Raise your hand high. How many people would say he was a smart guy? You're like, I didn't personally know him, but I mean, I guess he was smart. He theorized, this is awesome for me, this is great. He theorized the five ascending levels of intelligence. So we're going to start by uh, just a confessional moment. How many of you in this room, you think you're smart? Raise your hand high. Okay. How many think you're dumb? Let's see some hands up. How many think the person next to you that said they're smart is really not that smart? No, anyway, don't, don't do that. So check, this is awesome. I love this, especially as a preacher. I think this is really cool. He theorized five ascending levels of intelligence. So he started with number five. He said, if you want to look at the ascending levels of intelligence, number five, he would call smart people. Write it down, smart. So smart would be number five. You're like, Brent, all we're doing is we're playing that little peg game at the Cracker Barrel at this moment. So he said above smart people are number four, intelligent people. That you're a little more, intelli- more smart than smart people. Now, put the dumb people aside. He's locking in. I don't know if he did it by IQ or however he did this, but he theorized this. And he, he's trying to, like, figure out that most outstanding people among us. So smart people, intelligent people. Number three, he would categorize as brilliant people. Anybody in this room, that's you. You're like, Brent, I'm beyond smart. I'm brilliant. Would you raise your hand? You're like, I'm not going to do that. 
You're thinking it, I know. <laughs> then number two, beyond brilliant, I would consider myself in this category, the category of genius. Number two would be... <laughs> to, to joke, all right? More like Brent, we know you, all right? So, um, and then this might shock you, but he theorized that the number one level of intelligence, write the word simple. You're like, I don't get it. Lou, Lou will get this, right? That the genius, most incredible, outstanding men and women teachers people among us are the ones that can take the most complicated issues and make them what? Simple. We all wish we had teachers like that in high school, right? Take the calculus and trig and make it simple. Typically, teachers can make stuff simple and make it complicated. Preachers are worse, right? We can take the most simple things and make it like, what did you just say? Don't ever say that about me, by the way. But it's interesting to me. The simple stuff in life stands the test of time. Classics. Think of food. I've been on a food kick lately. Simple food. I like to go home and eat. And I think the older you get, sometimes the simpler the food. Now, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I've heard that as you're a child, you love jello. The older you get, it turns into jello, right? You go from jello into loving jello. But that's, anyway. Um, I go home and eat lunch. Guess what I love? One thing I've been craving a lot lately is peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Simple, right? How many people love the old PBJ? It's simple. For me, my wife will laugh because I've eaten it three days a week for the last seven weeks. I'll go home and I'll make me a turkey sandwich. Bread, turkey, cheese, tomato, mayonnaise. That's it. Whole wheat bread, of course. And I love it. She's like, are you going to eat anything else? I'm like, ah. I'm like, it's so good. It's simple. It's classic. She made an apple crisp dessert a few weeks ago. And she got, um, she asked me when she was at the store, hey, um, I'm going to make this dessert. What kind of ice cream would you want? And I just, for some reason, said, just get good old vanilla. Apple pie and vanilla ice cream. And you're like, you can't do that. It's Christmas. We can do whatever we want on Christmas. So we ate the apple dessert in five seconds, but it's funny how I've been turning on the tree and watching some Christmas stuff and eating the rest of the half a pint of just vanilla ice cream and just thinking how simple it is. Ice cold milk and a piece of chocolate cake. Oh, simple. You're like, Brent, you lost your mind. Here's how this all started. This week's message, a couple of weeks ago, not to bring up something that was tragically bad in our community, but a few weeks ago, we all know that we were going through this horrible, horrible season in our community that we did not have a football coach at the University of Tennessee. <laughs> and we really almost burned Knoxville down. Some of you almost got a divorce. It was bad. <laughs> And so I was listening. I like to listen to News Talk 99, 99.1 on your FM dial, Sports Talk Radio, The Eric Ainge Show, 9 to noon. Who's ever heard of The Eric Ainge Show? Raise your hand. Eric Ainge was a UT quarterback. He was a ball for life. And so, of course, a couple of weeks ago, the news talk was filled with who was going to be the head football coach. Everyone was upset in turmoil. We were ready to burn Neyland Stadium down because we didn't have a football coach. Thank God our priorities in our community are so perfectly aligned with God's. Um, and so, of course, everybody's saying we got to find a coach with a Tennessee family tree background. We needed T. Martin. We needed this. And here's how this whole thing, this message this week started. Somebody called and said, I think we should get Coach David Cutcliffe back to coach our football team. If you know anything about UT football, right? Coach Cutcliffe was the offensive coordinator when John uh, Chavis was the defensive coordinator and Philip Fulmer was the head coach. Who remembers those good old days? Good old Rocky Top. Remember, those were the days we used to sing that song because we could score. <laughs> By the way, did you notice how out of shape our male cheerleaders were this year at Tennessee? Because they didn't have to do any push-ups. We never scored. Anyway, um, oh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty bad. Um, 
So why I ask you to say something positive to someone is because somebody called up and said, I think we should get old Coach Cut back because didn't he coach up old Peyton Manning and he was pretty good. And Eric Ainge goes, yeah, Coach Cutcliffe was also my head coach. And the guy goes, well, Eric, you were a mediocre quarterback, but didn't he coach old Peyton Manning? And so after this positive comment, let's get somebody back like Coach Cutcliffe, who's been around a while. He's the head coach at Duke. Now, all of a sudden, the negative train starts to roll. Everybody calls in. Isn't he 140 years old? He don't know nothing about no modern offensive plays. We're stupid. We got to get some young guy up and comer that can run the ultra spread. You know how people just, they have no lives. Anyway, if that's you who called into that show, I'm sorry. I'm, yes, I'm yelling at you. You have no life. Anyway, um. So finally, Eric Ainge took offense to this. And he said, listen, don't ever say any negative thing about Coach David Cutcliffe because when he was the offensive coordinator, our offensive playbook was so complicated. I mean, we had formations and variations of formations and check downs, but this guy as a coach is a genius. No wonder we scored a ton of points because he could coach me as a quarterback and make the most complicated so simple that when I got into the huddle with my team and I got to the line of scrimmage, I knew I had an edge on the defense and we were going to find victory because the way he coached, I grasp it. That's sermon gold people right there. It's amazing. Our world is complicated. Christmas highlights that. We have to buy gifts. We all got sucked down this vortex of we just got to go spend money and we're like, we don't really have it, but we got we to gotta get our kids stuff because they got to go to school after Christmas and make sure our kids got as much as those kids did or Then we got to get the gift for the gift gift. And we got to go through all this obligation and this stress. And all the while we have political unrest. We have abuse on all fronts. Um, We have shaky foundations in our world today. It seems like the world is a very dark, complicated place. But the greatest among us can take the complicated and make it simple. Jesus came to the gospels and took complicated situations and made them very simple. God came into the darkness of the world and gave his only son that all of us can understand. It's so simple that we can grasp it and we can get it if we will focus on the meaningful. So you want to hear simple, turn to your Bible, and we're locking on the same verses of Scripture these last three weeks. This week is really an exclamation point till we get into next week, Christmas with family. We tie it all together in a bow. It's a great week, as Tracy said, to invite. We're going to traditional stuff, fun stuff, um, holiday stuff, but we are going to bring Jesus the most important thing. We're going to bring the light of the world. We're going to bring it to a point to where everyone can grasp it. Listen to simple. Ready? Listen to this verse of Scripture. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. We've been talking about it and ask yourself, what do you see? God is nowhere or God is now here. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. It can't get no more simple than that. People today, I I, I kind of believe it with all of my heart. We have an awareness that something's not right. We have all the stuff. We have all the toys. We have a lot of status. But man, something is not clicking. Life seems to be misfiring. Most of us in this room are carrying pockets. Dangerous levels of anxiety and stress, maybe pain. It might be the first Christmas that you're facing without a loved one, whether that's death or divorce a relationship separation. You might look good on the exterior. You might be okay, but when you walk in the door, you're really asking a very serious, tough question. And it sometimes seems so complicated. Hey, is this time of year, how is this going to make a difference? What kind of answer can you give me that it can really make a difference in my life, though you look great on the exterior? A lot of you look amazing. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. I pulled out the white jacket this week. Wednesday night, I walked down the aisle, and I had my white jacket on, and a lady looked at me. She goes, Pastor, is that a new jacket? I'm like, no, I've had this like nine years. I've worn this a lot. She goes, you look thin. And I'm like, I love you. And of course, I walked three rows down, and there's Daryl. Some of you know Daryl, and he didn't hear what she said. And Daryl goes, preacher, you shouldn't be wearing white. You gained a few pounds. (laughs) 
No. I looked at him and I said, I've weighed, weighed the same weight I've weighed forever. I weigh 180 pounds. It's been that, I've been that for a long time now. And of course, Wednesday night when I said this, somebody screamed out in the crowd, maybe Santa needs to bring you a new scale for Christmas this year. <laughs> out loud. The ushers came forward and removed him immediately by force. <laughs> and I made sure he was tased in the lobby before. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we all look good on the exterior, but what about our heart of hearts? Maybe some of you in your heart of hearts right now, your marriage is on the rocks. You're thinking this might be the last Christmas that you're married to that person sitting next to you. Some of us got a bad report from the doctor. Just a routine checkup. And man, you start rolling down that road, man, you're talking about some things that can go on in your heart. Maybe, is this the last year that I'll spend with a love? We, we, no one knows what tomorrow holds and we're asking ourselves a question, what answer can give me hope? And it all goes back, if you want to keep it simple and not complicated, it all goes back to Emmanuel, right? Which means God with us. So I want you to write a few things down. I love this, and this is why we celebrate this time of year, why it's so important to do that. Why we've, we've all get, we're given four hours to celebrating the meaningful, and here's why. Our God did not settle for an illusion of identification when it comes to us, that God can relate to us. I love it that God didn't send Jesus down the staircase of heaven and Jesus would snap a selfie with the angels and the shepherds and the wise man and say, well, I showed up on this God-forsaken planet to do what I had to do. I at least gave an illusion that I'm with you. And then he went back to he heaven. Write this down. You want to keep it simple? Let's keep it simple for a minute. Write this down or look at this verse of scripture, John 1, 14. We've been using it for a while. The Word, that is Jesus, became flesh. Underline this word if you have your Bible. Write it down and think about this. Dwell on it this week. And dwelt. The Word dwelt among us. He lived among us. He breathed among us. He identifies with us. All that is happening in our lives, all that is going on, this complicated, dark, crazy, out of control world that we sometimes like, I mean, God, where are you? God identifies with us. How did Christ identify with us? Write a few things down. Number one, the implications of Emmanuel. Ready? Number one, Christ identifies with us relationally. He understands relationships he was involved in relationships. God now, think about this, the creator of everything, had an adopted father. Jesus had a mother, had brothers and sisters, had aunts and uncles. He had friends like Peter and James and Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He understood what it was like to be an infant. He understood what it was like to be a junior high or a senior high student, a single adult. And yet some of us, and maybe this is you, I'm just talking with love to you, some of us are saying right here, right now, especially at Christmas, no one understands what I'm going through. No one can feel what I am feeling. And you look around, you're like, so many families are going to have such a great Christmas season together. Next week, they're going to celebrate traditions. And you don't know what I'm going through. I'm alone. Um, my life has been ruined, whether it's by my choice or somebody else's. And I won't have what so many other people have. And so you can sit here and some little clean sermon preacher, but you don't understand what I'm feeling. My dad um, told me this story. It didn't happen to anybody. It didn't happen to somebody in our church, but it happened to a lady in this community years ago that a husband walked out on a woman and her two young daughters for another woman right before Christmas, right here in this community. So the wife feeling a sense of abandonment, the two daughters feeling a sense of abandonment, the wife like, what can we do here? How can, I, how can I make this somewhat more comfortable for us at Christmas? What can I possibly get that will help us? And so she smartly went and bought a puppy for her two daughters for Christmas because we know that Christians are dog owners and love dogs. By the way, my, my daughter 
She has a dog named Maverick, a Dotson, named after Chasing Mavericks, Live Like Jay. And she, they, for some reason, just got another Dotson. And she asked me what to name it, and they took my advice. And I, I said, if you're going to keep it after, like, wave names, why don't you name the girl Dotson Why a Maya, Maya for short, Maya and Maverick. Pretty cool. They're so cute. I've, I've told my mother, I, I, I ate dinner with her the other night, and I said, hypothetically, Mom, um, um, if you get a dog for Christmas, are you going to be okay with that? <laughs> hypothetically. And she looked at me, and she goes, no. And I told my son, I said, shh, shh be, be quiet, because we got her a German Shepherd, but she doesn't. <laughs> We know that dogs can be companions, so this mother got this two, this, these two young daughters, a little puppy, a little, a little male dog, and so, of course, they opened up this present. Uh, this is, that's, a, that's a life-changing present at Christmas, a dog, and the young one, being innocent, just simply blurted out, blurted out let's, let's name the little dog after Dad. Just innocent. Nothing wrong with that. To which the older one, who knew what was going on, screamed, began to cry, and said, we will not name this puppy after Daddy. He will just run away too. <sighs> Some of you, you can relate. Somebody's run out on you this year. That person's no longer with you. Maybe you've had a relative that has kind of relationally checked out. Maybe a parent, you have a child that's checked out. Maybe a, a, a child, you're an adult child and you don't have a relationship with a parent anymore. I mean, a lot of us go through um, big time heartache, especially this time of year. And we say this, that nobody understands. But the implications of Emmanuel means this. You can add two words to that statement. No one understands except Jesus. I love it that he ascended into heaven after his earthly ministry and he still made this powerful statement, lo, I am with you always. Secondly, you might not think about this, but this is a good one for this time of year. Um, as you flip the calendar and we're all getting older and we continue to do what we do, Christ can relate to us in our work life. He can really identify with us in our work life. You don't really think about it that much. You're thinking, well, how is that possible? How can he identify with me? We know that he began his public ministry at what age? Age 30. Isn't that interesting how specific that is, that Christ would wait till he's 30 years old and he would have a three-year ministry. He died on the cross when he was 33 years old and he rose again to conquer the keys of death, hell, and the grave. So he spent three years as a minister, but for most of his life, he worked in the workplace. He was in his family's business. He was a he was a carpenter did that mean he had hammer and nails and he built barns no last week i showed you my barn video how many people saw that that was good right a little barn cue the horses right walking along my son who ran camera this morning he got so mad at me after last week's message he said dad you're leading your church people astray i'm like why because you're just teaching them wrong because Christ would have not been born in a barn made of wood. If you go to Israel, there would have been nothing made of wood in that time frame. More than likely, Christ would have been born in a, in a cave. Jesus was not a carpenter as, hey, I'm finishing um, the backyard or deck. He would have been a stonemason. He would have worked with his hands. He would have worked, um, been rugged. I mean, you think about this. He would have dealt with picky clients and pay disputes. He would have been in the family business. Probably most scholars would say around 12 years old and beyond that he began to work in the family business. I think that is a great, if we want to take the biblical approach, our kids should start working at least by 12. They can go to school full-time and work at Dairy Queen for at least 20 hours, right? I mean, come on. Some of you are like, move on quickly. Um, we know he spent more time in the workplace than he did in ministry. It's the genius of God, if you think about this in a really simple way. Why? Because where do we spend most of our time? As an adult, where will we spend the lion's share of our time in our lives? In the workplace. Anybody in this room retired? Raise your hands high. All of us hate you. <laughs> I'm retiring, by the way. Next week is my last week. So I love you guys. I'm retiring to Tahiti. No, I'm just kidding. But listen, think about this. Some of you go, Brent, people don't understand what I have to go through at work. I'm like the only Christian there. 
I can't really even do my job and really do it the right way. I always, it's always sleazy where I have to work. I don't really feel like my boss even appreciates me. I'm not going to get a Christmas bonus. I'm barely going to get a thank you. I'm not even going to get a Clark Griswold Jelly of the Month Club gift card. I'm going to get nothing for Christmas. And so no wonder I have no cheer. I hate living. Listen, God can identify. He sent his only son, and Jesus didn't just hang out in the synagogues and just preach, did he? He worked. That's genius of God. You understand how powerfully important that is to know that he can relate to us on an everyday level. And he was a man. I mean, you know what ticks me off? And there's a lot of paintings of Jesus that dawn a lot of lobbies in churches across America of some pale, frail, blonde-headed, puny-looking Jesus type. Kind of looks like Yanni. (laughs) Jesus was rugged. I've been to Israel three times, and I can barely get around Israel in an air-conditioned bus much less walk that hillside and work with his hands. He can relate to us. And you're like, well, never thought of it that way. Thirdly, emotionally. Jesus can relate to us emotionally. We're emotional creatures. Just think of the holidays with family. Some of you are so worried about spending time with the in-laws who can't wait to go hang out with the in-laws at Christmas. Who's like, oh, I'd rather go to the dentist and get a root canal, but I got to (laughs) go. Jesus can relate to us emotionally. Just think through it just for a minute. Has anybody ever turned their back on you when you needed them the most? Jesus, at his deepest point of need, the people that were closest to him turned their backs on him. If you think about it, all of us did because of our sin. Christ lost one of his best friends, Lazarus. He knew what it was like to lose, to hurt. Have you ever felt like you've had so much stress and so much pressure on you that you can't take it one more day? Do you know the night that Jesus was arrested, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you remember this? He was so anxious so troubled that he actually sweat drops of blood. Why? He was not walking into something naive and like, I wonder what's going to happen. He knew the score. He knew what was about to take place. Man, he can relate. So for me, you know, one of my favorite verses, even at Christmas time, which is not a Christmas verse, is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. This is what it says. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knew the full pull of even temptation. Do you know why? Because he resisted it. We understand that in God's word. Only somebody who has resisted temptation knows the full pull of it. He's been there. He knows the score. He knows the situation. So 1 Peter 5, 7 is something meaningful to lean on this Christmas. Cast all of your anxiety on Christ because he cares for you. Next week, um, at Christmas time, people get kind of spiritual. I embrace that. Some Christians don't like it. Some Some of us make fun of people that are going to come to church next week. We call them CEOs, right? Christmas, Easter only people. All the CEOs are heading to church next week. Preacher, you might as well throw in the Easter sermon while you're at it. And they'll get both, two, of two, two for the price of one. I love it that they come. Why? Because they're coming for a reason. Christ draws us. If you've grown up in a culture at all, you know the the deal. You know what? Christmas is really nothing if you take Christ away from it. It's just a celebration that's here today and gone tomorrow. It's traditions that don't matter. But next week, people will come and we'll hook them in with traditions that they know and love. We'll have some fun. We'll drop the walls. But we'll bring the message of Christ. And not just baby Jesus in the crib Because people like to minimize 
the magnitude of our Savior by keeping him in the manger. It's just easier that way. It's more comfortable. But Christ went from the cradle to the cross, from the crib to the cross, died an excruciating death, but along the way identifies with us in our lives. Knows the score. To me, that's why Christmas, if you want to keep it simple, is a big deal. We can make it complicated, but it's really simple. Last Monday night, I got a chance to hang out with our youth. I got to be the old youth pastor, Brent. Loved it. Zany, fun, weird games we played. One of the games I used to love, and it still is just one of those cla- Christmas is classic. This is a classic game. It stands the test of time called Two Truths and a Lie. So I invited five teenagers on the platform. I told them before um, youth started, I want you to come up with three statements about yourself. Two of them are true, one of them is a lie. I want you to make it good. Boy, we got some great liars in our church. Those teens can lie. You're like, preacher, you need to preach out of more. You know how they learned to lie? From mama and daddy. I did find out we have weird teenagers in our church, though. One girl said, I eat grass. And I'm like, that's your lie. She goes, no, that was true. (laughs) Step aside. You know, I mean, it was, why did I play that game with them as I talked to them about the Christmas season and kept it simple? You know what? There's so many truths and so many lies about Christmas. Do we believe in Jesus and Santa or Frosty or Rudolph? What matters? What's the truth and what's the lie? Here's the truth. Ready? Three things I want you to write down. Keep it simple at Christmas. Why is Christmas a big deal? I told our youth that. They're all old enough where the Santa thing has kind of left the train and we're not too worried about that anymore. But there are three reasons why Christmas, if you want to keep it simple, is a big deal. Number one, write the word significance. Two, write the word purpose. Three, write the word outcome. And think about those three words. I told our teenagers, get your phones out. Type some notes on your phone. Y'all are not going to write nothing down. Type it on your phone and lock in on this. Significance, purpose, and outcome. The significance, Emmanuel. God can relate to you. Even as a teenager, he can relate to you. He's been there. The purpose, why did he come? To not just relate to you, but to pay for your sin. And the outcome that you can have a relationship with God, a gift that you and I don't deserve. That's what we believe. What do you believe? Why is Christmas a big deal to you? Why should we celebrate? Well, we know that Jesus didn't ask us to celebrate his birth. He asked us to remember his death. So do me a favor and pull out that communion element, if you would. I you to grab that wafer and then peel off that bottom layer and just hold on to that cup of juice and let's realize how real Emmanuel, God with us, is in our lives. So real that Jesus Christ would be born, he would live a life that he can identify with us, and he would die on a cross for our sin. Take that bread, break it, eat it. And as real as that wafer tastes, which we always say there ain't nothing that tastes like that wafer, But as real as that taste, that's how real Emmanuel, God with us, God with skin on, dwelt among us, lived among us, identifies with us, gave his life, gave his body for us. How cool is that? I mean, it's the greatest message we'll ever know, a gift that we don't deserve. All the choices. Some of you, yes, people have run out on you, but a lot of you are runners as well. You want to run away from the truth. But even in that, God loves you. And what is lost can be found again because of Christ. Take the juice, drink. Remember the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, the old chorus we used to sing, Lord, we lift your name on high. Let's pray. Fathers, we close the service with life change on display and we've been baptizing in all the services in this um, service we have three children um, we, we've talked to them we know that they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and you know I, I'm 
Sometimes, to me, I, I, I talk hard at the kids because I want them to understand what it really means, but it is really cool as we close this service down with three children, um, um, just young people, life change on display. We know it's all about a Christ child that made a difference. We know it's childlike faith that we approach your throne with grace. We know that we approach your throne with awe and wonder and gratitude and just a sense of grace. God, we believe that you came from heaven. We believe you identified with us. We believe that what you have done has set us free. May we celebrate that. Never take for granted and understand the truth, the meaningful truth of what this time of year holds for us as it fuels our faith in the greater days, in the greater days, in the greater days to come. God, let us walk out of here full of hope, full of purpose, full of awe, full of wonder, full of gratitude, but mostly important, awareness of your grace and what you have done for us. We believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...